would like to speak this evening about God's overwhelming power, the mighty power of God, not in creation, not in handling and often in overriding the natural course of events, not his power in the physical realm, but his power in the spiritual realm, and particularly his power in human hearts when he chooses to act. Now, Christ had been crucified, and a little over seven weeks has elapsed. And the significant matter here is that as he, at his crucifixion, pretty well all the population of Jerusalem swelled by many visitors from all kinds of countries and lands where Jews had been dispersed. Now men were visiting Jerusalem for a special feast, and here it was, and Christ at that time was crucified. And they were screaming and shouting for his execution. Crowds of people from Galilee, from Judah, from the regions round about, and visitors from afar. So many of the people in the crowds that were persuaded, that were whipped up to shout for the execution of Christ, so many of them had been touched by his mighty power. So many people in those lands had been healed. Thousands at every place where Christ called and preached. Remarkable healings. Healings that could not be counterfeited, could not be imitated, were lasting. And yet, in spite of all this mountain of evidence indicating the divinity of Christ, that he was from God, that he was indeed the Messiah, they were persuaded to scream for his execution. One of the lines of reasoning taken by the Jewish authorities at the time who sought this were that uh, he would bring down, Christ would bring down the wrath of Roman authority on their countries. They were under the Roman yoke, under Roman bondage. And uh, it was feared or it was claimed that Christ, who was being called a king, would provoke the reaction and the anger of the Roman military authorities and ultimately of Caesar himself. And the crowd, egged on by these kind of things, turned against him. Well, they didn't want him. They didn't want Christ because of his message. Oh, they liked his healings. It was a time when they would have taken him and made him king by force. They liked all that, but they didn't like his preaching, his message, which was that they were sinful people and they must repent of their sin and turn to God and trust in him. And they didn't want that. What they wanted was their Messiah, who was expected not to be a spiritual deliverer, but they wanted him to be an earthly, political deliverer. And Christ plainly had no intention of giving them earthly, political deliverance, but of being one who would secure for them forgiveness of sin and reconciliation with God and communion with him. And for those reasons, because they were convicted by his preaching, they looked past the evidence that he was from God and he was divine and cried out for his execution. Now, as the preaching here in Acts 2 goes on to explain, it was God's will. It was God's predetermined counsel and will that Christ should be executed. That is what he'd come for. He'd come... God entering into human flesh in order to be our representative and to suffer and to die. And God to smite him, strike him with his, all the wrath that sinners deserved. And he would bear it away so that he had the right, he purchased the right to pardon and forgive all those who he called to himself. Now, friends, uh, that, that was clear, that, that God himself, the triune Godhead, before the world began, 
knowing exactly how man would rebel, determined the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, three persons, one Godhead, they determined that there would be a Savior and Christ would be that Savior, the second person of the Godhead, and he would come. What an astonishing plan of salvation. And yet, men actually carried it out. Though God intended it should happen, wicked hands took him and crucified him. They did it. Now, all that had happened just over seven weeks before this first sermon of the Christian church is given by the Apostle Peter. And what I want particularly to call you to notice is verse 37. Now, when they heard this, the long sermon, we'll touch on it in just a moment, they were pricked in their heart. Now, the King James translation, which is uh, very vulnerable, is sometimes um, uh, old-fashioned. Well, frequently old-fashioned. And this is an example. They were pricked in their heart. A prick nowadays is a small thing. You're pricked with a pin or something of that kind. You'd refer to being pricked, you would refer to some gentle affliction. But it wasn't so in the days of the King James translation. It was quite a strong word. It could be, it could describe something much more serious. Today, it would be more accurate to say they were pierced in their heart. And that is what the Greek indicates. In fact, the compound Greek word translated here, pricked, actually is very uh, emphatic. They were pierced right through. That's what it amounts to. That's what it means. So pricked is too gentle and too small. However, now when they heard this, they were pricked or pierced in their heart or cut to the heart or even better, cut through the heart would do justice to the original. And they said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? I'd like to say a few things about the effect that the first sermon had on these hearers resulting in 3,000 people on that occasion turning to the Lord. The word is used in military literature, cut through. Can you imagine that there is an attack going on and uh, the people on one side of this uh, conflict are very confident They're soldiers, they're in the majority, they outnumber their opponents, they're battle confident, they feel superior, they feel invincible, and they surge forward and they have all the advantages in their favor, and they storm down the hill upon their enemy who they're going to rout. And one very confident soldier, perhaps, near in the front rank, suddenly finds a great blow and he's pierced by a spear or a sword. And in a moment, his legs are weak and he collapses, he staggers, collapses. His chest sinks into his stomach and he gasps for air. And he knows he's dying and he's struck, he's fallen on the field of battle. And he feels just in a moment, amidst the pain, a kind of terrible humiliation This was a victory charge, and he's down all of a sudden, and there he lies on the ground, dying in shock. That's how the word is used in ancient literature. Pricked to the heart isn't enough. They were pierced right through, suddenly. What's going on? People who screamed and shouted for the death of Christ who yelled at the authorities, crucify him, who chose Barabbas to be released rather than Christ, hardened people, people who will be justifying themselves for what's been accomplished, so they think, with the execution of Christ. And now, within just a matter of weeks, 
they are completely stunned and nonplussed. Well, that's the narrative we're reading. And this is how people are converted. And it always was, and it always is. If somebody is converted from being an unbeliever to a true believer in God and in Christ and becomes a child of God, repents of sin, trusts in Christ and him alone, it's because they have received a shock like this. They may have been very proud people. Ah, oh, contemptuous. No, unbelievers. Just contempt for the Bible, for God, for Christ. Then there's a shock which changes everything. And it changes them. And they're pierced to the heart, not physically, obviously, but spiritually, in their conscience, in their feelings. This is what happens when somebody is converted. And it may be somebody who wasn't actively hostile to the Christian faith, but was just indifferent, completely unmoved and unaffected. And suddenly it all means so much. And they're pierced. And it's an urgent matter. I must have peace with God. I must find him. And their friends say, he never spoke like this. He never thought like this. Those who know him and are close to him. Maybe somebody who was unteachable. Maybe somebody who's so happy in their living for this world and for their ambitions and their purely earthly pleasures. And yes, even including sinful pleasures. And they're happy with these things. They're not discontented. They don't have any need in any area of life. And suddenly the shock comes and they feel their need of God. And that's what we're reading about here. And this 37th verse, now when they heard this, the preaching of Peter, they were pierced through the heart and said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, what shall we do? What can we do? And this is what we have to think about. Conversion is a shock. It's a shock to the old life. One moment complacent. One moment unmoved. Many people, they come to church for years. Maybe grow up in, in worshipping families. They come to church and it just all rolls past them. They never feel anything, never take anything seriously. And then maybe there comes a day, they may still be young, they may be a little older, when suddenly they're pierced. And this matters. This is the most important, the most urgent thing, that they must settle their relationship with God. And they feel bad before him, and ashamed, and guilty, and in need, even condemned. This is what we're speaking of this evening. And friends, uh, this is how it happened. Let me point you back to verse 22 of this second chapter. Here is Peter, ye men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God among you by miracles and wonders and signs, which God did by him in the midst of you, as ye yourselves know. What brought the shock in their case was quite a long sermon, and we probably only have the basic notes of it recorded here in Acts 2. It may have been much longer than it appears here. These are the salient factors. It includes teaching about Christ, that he was the authenticated saviour, authenticated by God with miracles and wonders and signs which were seen by everyone and they should have believed in him well they didn't and they hadn't and they dismissed all that and they cried out for his death but now when being reminded of these things because God is at work suddenly they're pierced right through now, I know so many people, and it was the case with me also, to whom this has happened. We've heard these things, that we are sinners, that we are condemned, and yet God in his mercy has sent a saviour, the Lord Jesus Christ, and he has made an atonement 
for those who he will bring to repentance and to seek salvation. And we've heard these things, but it's never moved us. It's never affected us. And some of us have been for years without ever being touched, without ever being affected. And then suddenly we realize, we realize a whole group of things at the same time. This is true. Christ is God. He did this for sinners. Without him, we're eternally condemned. And the things that we had heard suddenly become real and true. And it shakes us and it affects us. It can happen almost overnight, from Thursday to Friday. And suddenly our attitude is changed and our entire outlook. And we realize we are these sinners who need salvation, who need forgiveness. I am the one who deserves to die. I am the condemned person. I have done terrible things. I am, and we think of our heart sins, the sins that cling to us all the time. And everybody can say, I am that proud person, that selfish person, that dishonest person, and so on. And we're struck and affected, and as it were, in our conscience and in our emotions, we reel and stagger. This is true, and I've underestimated all this, and I haven't taken proper account of it. So there's deep concern and alarm about my unbelief, how I've insulted God, about my self-love and self-service, about my lack of homage to him, and I've never thanked him and praised him for life and for powers and gifts and benefits, and about perhaps covetousness and ambition just for self and all these things and all the individual sins that I commit. That's the beginning of conversion, to see who Christ was and to see who I am and how great is my need. And eternity depends on whether I belong to him or not, whether I come to him and whether I repent before him. That's what we're thinking of in this. Even our worldview. What is your worldview? We have a lot of this term, worldview. It's a fairly modern term, in fact. What is your worldview? Well, the biblical worldview, the way in which we look at the world and its nature and its purpose, the biblical worldview starts with this, that God, Almighty God, made all things that are made from nothing. He made it all. The unbelieving worldview is just about the opposite, that nothing gave rise to everything that exists, that everything came from nothing. And the great struggle of man, by every means possible, is to try to make a plausible explanation and to make sense of the notion that nothing made everything. That is what so much unbelieving science is about. Concocting explanations and devising theories and going to vast expense to try to establish some reality to their explanation as to how nothing can make everything. We could carry this worldview a little further. The unbelieving worldview is that nothing made everything for nothing, because it's all going to blast into tiny particles and disappear, and a human race and everything that people strive for and all accomplishment is going to disappear without trace. Is that your worldview? Nothing gave rise to everything, the dealt destiny and the aim being nothing. Well, in the scripture, that is foolishness. It is described as foolish. Doesn't mean that people are foolish. If you believe that, that nothing gave rise to everything for nothing, it doesn't that, you're not intellectually foolish. 
but you are morally foolish and you are foolish in your reasoning and you're not applying your intellect and your capabilities to be satisfied and content with that worldview, with that idea. The fool hath said in his heart, said King David, there is no God. But we're not fools in terms of intellectual endowment, in terms of intelligence, but as I say, we are in our decisions. Reject God, reject the Creator, reject His Word, well, we're just asleep to Him, and we're asleep to eternity. And we're unconscious of our spiritual need and of what will happen to us eternally. We're not paying any attention to it. And we're lifeless in terms of a relationship with God and giving praise to him. And we're unseeing of spiritual dangers and spiritual blessings. And we're unseeing of God. We don't understand his power or his holiness or his justice. And we have no hope, no future, no eternal life. And we're dead in the sense that we have no power to engage with God and we have no power to reform our lives. Why, this is what this worldview leads to, that nothing gave rise to everything for the ultimate objective of nothingness? That's not that. Well, David says, King David says rightly, the fool hath said, not maybe in his brain, but in his heart, there is no God. And conversion is when suddenly there's an explosion in the mind and we wake up to this. What a fool I've been. What I have disregarded and swept aside and taken no account of. Oh, dear friends, may God touch your soul. May God touch your heart. We have to see, and it's a shock to us when it comes, that we're offensive before him. And it's insulting our unbelief of him and rejection of him. The mighty God, the everlasting God, makes you and me with care, fashions us, equips us, but we're tiny before him, minute for all our powers. And in our minuteness, we look up to God and we reject him and dismiss him and slander him. What fools we are. And how deservedly we bring the condemnation of God down upon ourselves. We have no defense, no excuse for our unbelief, no excuse for our sin. We make these foolish decisions and we turn away from the living God. But conversion, it changes things. Suddenly, unaccountably, you might say, we long for forgiveness for peace with God, for union with him, to have him, to walk with him. We long for a transformation in our lives which God can give us, which will give us understanding of him, will give us a walk with him, will give us forgiveness and power and eternal life. These are wonderful things, dear friends, and it hits us suddenly that we're adrift. Well, you know, it happens on a very small scale, regularly to everyone. You're heading for the airport and it suddenly re it comes to you the realization you haven't got your passport and you go cold within yourself and you rummage round everywhere and check through your bags and so on. It's a shock. You can't remember packing it. You think suddenly in your mind, there it is, I see it on a mantelpiece somewhere in the back of the house. Well, you've had these shocks in many different things, not necessarily that one. And this is what it's like, only worse, when you come to realize, I am lost before God. He is the God who is there. Christ Jesus is the Savior 
who came to suffer and to die for sinners, and I have made him my enemy and dismissed him. And you go cold within you, and you long to know where you stand and what can be done. And that's what this passage is about. Now, when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart, pierced through, and said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? Is there any way we can make up for this? What's going to become of us? That we have been party to the execution of the Messiah? It was God's will. That's what Christ came for, to be executed. But nevertheless, they are still responsible that they screamed for it, and they did it. What shall we do? And verse 38, oh, then Peter said unto them, repent, repent. That's not a negative word, repent. What do they understand him to be saying? Oh, there is hope. That word, repent. It may strike you as being a very negative word. Here's something unpleasant that I've got to do. I've got to push aside my pride and get on my knees. And I've got to repent of my sin. Yes, but there's another side to this word, repent. The way they hear it, ah, there is hope. There is a way. God is ready to forgive us. God will pardon us even for this great, great sin. God will take that sin and that guilt and sweep it aside. And God, after all, will bless us and we may be reconciled with him and find him and walk with him. And he will love us and he will guide us and help us and take us to a glorious eternity. That word repent contains it all. Well, it would. If you had offended somebody very badly, and you said to his friend, what can I do? What can I do? And that friend said, I'll tell you what you can do. Apologize. That's hope. Is, is, if I do that, it'll be all right. If I do that, I will be forgiven. Yes. So the word apologize, it's an instruction to do something humbling. But it's also a word of promise. You do that and you can be forgiven. You do that, and friendly relations can be restored. It's the same here. They hear, what, what can we do? We are lost, we're condemned, repent. That's it. Yes, repent. You mean, we don't have to do some great thing which is impossible for us? We don't have to do some great penance or pay a price? Repent. That's what you have to do. That's wonderful, friends. You and I, who could never pay God, who could never make up for our sin, who could never make up for the offense we have been to him and keep his law and match his standards, instead he says, repent. That's a wonderful word. That is all. Repent. Repent means Turn from your sin, change your mind, turn from your love of yourself and your sin and the things in this world. Tell God you regret all that you are and all that you've done. Humble yourself before him and turn your eyes upon him and upon what is done on Calvary to take away the punishment of sin for all who repent. That's all. And you do that with all your heart and he receives you and he changes you and he saves you amazingly. What shall we do, they said. Seriousness has now come upon them. The jokers among them joke no more. They're all anxious people. We've killed the Messiah. What can we do? The assertive ones who've always got a, an answer, they're silent, they want to know the reply. What can we do? There's a brokenness there. And yet that word is so precious to them. Repent, that's the great word tonight. 
Repent, friends. Go to God in shame. Tell him you know you're a sinner. You're under his condemnation. I don't believe the preaching of the Apostle Peter in this first sermon involved any emotional manipulation. I don't think it involved any uh, powerful theatrical emotionalism at all. I haven't been expounding the sermon, but it's so closely reasoned. It's a reasoning message. It explains prophecy to them. It explains what David said. As you read it, you think this is not what somebody might call an exciting sermon, a stirring sermon, a shouting sermon. It's nothing like that. It's closely reasoned, appealing, remonstrating sermon. But because God was there and because he was at work, people who were effectively accomplices to murder were turned completely round and they were humbled. What can we do? That's the spirit in which you come to God. Repent, then I will repent with all my heart. I will repent of my sin. I will turn myself and my life over to Christ, my Savior. If only he will change me and receive me and bless me, make me his child and an heir of heaven, I will yield to him as my Lord and my God. Peter preaches to them, repent, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, no other name will do, for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. And he also said to them, save yourselves from this untoward generation. Leave all the bright lights and the things of the world and its sinful entertainments and ideas and turn yourself completely over to Christ. And verse 41, then they that gladly received his word, gladly, the Greek has a compound word which means something like that, then they that received his word with great delight, so uplifted they were baptized and there were 3,000 added and it was real conversions. Verse 42, they continued steadfastly forever onwards in the doctrine and in fellowship and in worship and in praying and fear, that means deep respect, came upon every soul and the apostles went on doing their signs and wonders. And I may just add a little postscript. These conversions were so genuine that you know in those days, converted Jews would so infuriate their families that they would be put out on the street. Young people, teenagers, thrown out, dispossessed entirely. People who shared houses. So there was great poverty. There was great persecution. People were cut off from their families and so on. And that's the reason why in those earliest days, among those first 3,000 converts, they had everything in common. And the people who were left destitute and penniless were provided for by the others. There was such fellowship and mutual kindness. These were changed people. They were people with hearts brimming with sympathy and consideration for their fellows. So this is how it started. Hatred of Christ, rejection of him, and the great shock which brought them to see their spiritual need, that they were sinners under judgment, and to appreciate Christ and what he meant and what he'd done. And that's what we need to have. Every one of you, friends, if you've never been shocked, if you've never been moved, if you've never been astonished, that God would come and die for sinners and that you are that sinner and you're under condemnation. Oh, may God help you and open your eyes and enable you to feel 
so that you come to him and repent and trust in Christ. Let's pray together. Oh God, our gracious Heavenly Father, challenge our souls, we pray. Let it not be that there are those among us who will go on throughout life without a Savior, without a Redeemer, without a heavenly hope, increasingly in the pocket, in the influence of an unbelieving world, Oh, Lord, save, we pray. Save the young. Show them reality. Show them the truth. Look upon us all, young and old, and in thy saving power, oh, Lord, deal with us and draw us to thyself. We ask these things in the name of our Saviour, for his sake. Amen.